Hello, oh, and welcome to the video lecture for chapter 12 on the topic of solids from Conceptual Physics 12th edition by Paul G. Hewitt. Okay, so in our last chapter we talked about atoms and in the next, this chapter and then the following two chapters we're going to talk about all the things that atoms can do. Now when I say that I'm not talking about really cool things like the splitting of the atom and nuclear energy because that's modern physics and we leave it for the end of the book. But for now we're going to take a more basic view and historic view of what happens when you put atoms together. Well you can form solids, liquids, and gases. Well let's talk about solids. Okay? So really kind of leaving, maybe leaving off where we left off with atoms, kind of taking the next nat natural um, step, we'll talk about the crystalline structure of solids, which is essentially how the atoms are actually formed together in this, this thing that has a, it's called a crystalline structure. Then we're going to get into some more macroscopic ideas like density, elasticity, tension and compression, and then some kind of applications of thinking about solids, which is the arch. And then I guess maybe this isn't an application, but it's kind of a tangentially related idea, which is scaling which is kind of a mathematical reality, but ends up having a lot of real world consequences, okay? Usually involving solids because solids keep their shape and liquids and gases don't, so scaling isn't so relevant. But we'll get to that when we get to it, okay? So let's talk about crystal structures, okay? So atoms in a solid are arranged in a regular array called a crystal, okay? If you shine an X-ray beam on a solid and it produces an X-ray diffraction pattern, this is evident, uh, evidence of the crystalline nature of the solid, okay? So you can, get, you can get patterns that look like this. There's lots of historical um, studies, you know, from about 100 years ago where they're actually doing this, basically taking beams of X-rays. The whole reason you get something called a diffraction pattern is an idea we'll talk about later when we talk about how light can behave like a wave and interfere with, this, interfere with itself, and we'll draw analogies to water and sound waves. But, you know, again, you'll have to wait for it. Um, an x-ray, by the way, is just high energy light. You've probably heard of x-rays for looking at the bones inside of your body or your teeth, for example. Um, one thing I will say is that it, not all solids are arranged, arranged in regular arrays. Those are called crystalline solids. There are also things called amorphous solids, which where the atoms are just kind of all mixed up together. Um, so it really does vary, um, but certainly metals, lots of minerals have defined um, structures. You know, they really, it's like a geometric pattern. You know, there are little imperfections, but for the most part, it's a, it's a uniform pattern. All right, and um, yeah, the amorphous solids are the, the last the last type, okay? All right, so the following kinds of bonds can exist between atoms in a solid. This is how they held to hold together to make that crystalline structure or an amorphous structure. They can have ionic bonds, covalent bonds, metallic bonds, and van der Waal bonds, all right? The properties of a solid are dependent upon the kinds of bonds that exist between the atoms, okay? So important to know there's four different types of bonds. Um, in terms of this, the, um, the, the strongest to the weakest, they basically go in the order listed. Um, ionic bonds, those are ions. We talked about ions in the last chapter. That's where a, a particular element loses or gains electrons. And so when that happens, then you can have ions then that kind of will come together to become neutral. Covalent bonds is sort of similar, but instead of losing an electron, they're sharing an electron. So covalent, it's like they're being, they're, they're working together, okay? Um, so that's whereas ionic is, is actually like a taking of, of an electron or maybe filling a gap where you have a missing electron. Metallic is a bit different. Um, it does also have to do with those electrons because electrons, again, like I said before, really define all the chemical behavior, including the creating solids, which would be a kind of a chemical process, okay? Um, in fact, the whole idea of chemistry as a distinct science is kind of focusing on the electron, you know, that's what it's all about. Because in a sense, you could say, well, how, how is chemistry fundamentally different from physics, you know? Uh, but anyway, to not get off the rails, we won't, won't talk about, start talking about that. Um, but metallic bonds are kind of weaker. It has to do with the, a bunch of electrons being shared between many atoms as opposed to a covalent bond, which is just a, a, a pair of atoms in most cases. Um, van der Waals is kind of interesting. It, it really has less to do with the atoms. Um, Instead, but instead molecules. So you can really think of Va van der Waal forces as being forces and bond, bonding forces between molecules, okay? All right, um, now that's enough about the structure. Let's get into a property of solids, okay? So now, okay, we know they're made out of atoms. We know those atoms are bonded together and they form structures or sometimes they don't. All right, that's the amorphous case. But now we have a solid. Maybe it's a, it's a rock sitting on the table. Maybe it's a chunk of lead, whatever it may be, it's a solid. And that solid has a particular property called density. And density is just mass per volume. So it's just kilograms per cubic meter, all right? And it could also be expressed in terms of grams, GM, per cubic centimeter, okay? And 
those two are not numerically equivalent, okay? Um, but they're they're kind of they're they're going to be you know they're both commonly used. But if I wanted, but if I if I say if I express something a density in kilograms per cubic meter, let's take water for example. Well, water has a density of one thousand kilograms per cubic meter. Well, in the units of grams per cubic centimeter, it has one gram. I tend to write just g instead of gm per cubic centimeter. Both are acceptable. Okay, so. You notice they're again. You know they're both metric units, and it kind of you know it depends on the the kind of the field that you're using it in, and, and they're both commonly used. But notice, right, that water is one thousand kilograms, but it's only one gram, all right, um, per cubic meter and cubic centimeter respectively. So that's good to remember, right? They're not like interchangeable in that respect, and that has to do with the fact that there's a thousand grams per kilogram, but there is, believe it or not, a million cubic centimeters per cubic meter. And I should come back to that because that usually kind of seems wrong, but it's not. There are a million cubic centimeters per cubic meter. Okay. All right. So it is also sometimes expressed as weight density. All right. That's another way to talk about density. In that case, it would be newtons per cubic meter. Right. And that is um, usually specific to Earth. All right. So the idea of density could be, you know, used by astronomers to talk about things other than Earth. But if you're only interested in behavior, say mechanical processes on the surface of Earth, you might want to say, talk about water for a hydroelectric dam or something, you know, some real kind of applied app, um, field of engineering. Um, and then you could have, you know, weight per volume and newtons per cubic meter. But in that case, you're probably going to be using, at least in this country, you're going to not be using the metric system. Okay. All right. So density depends on the mass of the atoms and the spacing between the atoms. So fundamentally, that's why water has a density of a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. And for example, uh, what's, what's a, what um, mercury has a density of 14,000 kilograms per cubic meter. All right. So dense. So in other words, mercury, which has a element name of HG, whereas the molecule for water is H2O, mercury is 14 times denser than water, which is pretty unbelievable because mercury is a liquid is by far the densest liquid. Right. And, but that has to do with the very different atoms, because mercury is, is an element, um, so liquid mercury is a you know, pure elemental substance, um, maybe it might have some imperfections, but for the most part it's, or impurities, it might, um, is mostly a pure elemental substance, and its, it, its atoms are very large, they have a lot of uh, nucleons, and that, so that right there is kind of, that, that's the mass of the atoms. The spacing being a liquid is a bit different, and probably a bad example to bring up, because supposedly we're on a chapter on solids, so excuse me for that. Um, but gold, for example, gold, gold has a density, um, around 10,000. Um, and so it's, um, so that's kind of, um, let me think. Yeah. So it'll just say about 10,000, right? And that's, you know, that's a rough estimate, but that's kind of the density I tend to remember for around gold. Maybe it's like 10,500. So it's about 10 times denser than water. Okay. Um, and that, that of course is a solid. And then definitely the spacing has an effect there. All right. Um, and I guess I bring that up because you could actually have two substances that are made of basically the same atoms, but if the spacing is different, the densities can be different, okay? Even though they have the same number of nucleons in the actual atoms themselves, and the same number of protons and neutrons, okay? And as a property of the material, it doesn't matter how much you have. It's because you divide it by the volume, and you've, so that's why density is a, it's not a sample-specific quantity, okay? Whereas the mass would be, right? Okay, so that's that's density. Hopefully it's a concept that makes sense, you know, definitely um, kind of a, a natural concept. There's another thing about solids that's important, and that's called elasticity. That's about the stretchability. Some things you don't think is being very stretchable or compressible, like steel. Um, it is, okay, you can compress steel. Um, and if you think about, you know, certainly like a giant building would be putting a compressive force on steel, that steel is under compression. Um, but some things are very stretchable, um, like, you know, rubber, for example. So that's what we're talking about here. Or wood, for example, you know, you definitely, wood can bend, right? We can clearly see wood bending like a wooden beam. Okay, so an object, an object subjected to external forces may undergo changes in shape and or size. A body, that's like just an object, a body's elasticity is a measure of how much it changes when the forming force is exerted on it and how well it returns to its original shape. Okay, so there's going to be kind of a numerical property of elasticity, and then there's the more kind of qualitative, like, you know, is, is, it, is it a material that easily returns to its original length, or does it kind of have permanent deformation? Okay. So materials that do not return to their original shape are called inelastic. So that's important, okay? Because think about um, like a metal spring, right? I, trust, I, I, I pull out that metal spring and it springs back to its original length, okay? 
Now we can break a metal spring. I'm sure you've broken the metal spring of like a, of a push pencil or something or a push pin. But for the most part, they're, they're pretty good. You, you pull them back and they return to the original length. You pull them back, they return to the original length. What about a rubber band, all right? So if, you're, if you pull on a rubber band, yeah, it returns to its original length, but it always seems like it's a little less stretchy after you've done it, right? You can really kind of easily ruin a rubber band. Um, think about like um, a hair band, for example. Hair bands wear out quickly. They kind of you know, become just permanently elongated. That's also true of, you know, of any rubber band, all right? And I always give this example. Think about those push pins or push pencils, right? A mechanical pin or a mechanical pencil. Well, they're all made of metal springs. Why aren't they made with little um, you know, rubber bands, okay? Why? Because the rubber bands would wear out much faster. It wouldn't be practical to design them made of rubber bands. So rubber bands inherently wear out. They tend not to return to the original length, even though we think of them as something that is you know, reusable, stretchable, but in reality, we know they're not. So that actually means that rubber is quite inelastic by this definition, okay? And I bring that up right away on this slide because that is such a common misconception. People think that elastic just means stretchable. That's actually called ductility. So yes, rubber can be stretched many times its original length, more so than metal, but actually rubber is less elastic than metal. Steel, right? Um, you know, like any metal alloy is, has a higher elasticity than rubber because it's better at it returning to its original length and that's the definition. Okay, all right, let's move on. So which is more elastic, steel or rubber? Okay, were you just asleep? No, so you know the answer to this. It's steel, okay? It regains its original shape much better than rubber. Okay, so here's the one formula that, I think it's the, really, yeah, the one formula for the whole chapter. And it's the, and it's the formula that reply, applies to elasticity. And it's basically specific to springs. Again, you know, spring, like this basically anything that has a really good elasticity, it wouldn't work with rubber bands, okay? Um, because they're just not elastic enough. Nearly works, but doesn't work very well. And this relationship, this formula, whatever you want to call it, is called Hooke's Law, okay? And here's the formula. I'll talk about where it comes from. So what, what it says is it says that the extension of a spring is directly proportional, you've seen, seen that term before, to the force applied to it. So force is proportional to extension, all right? So the further I stretch my spring, the more force it takes. If I want to, to stretch a spring, right? So look, look at the stretch here. Here's the original length. We'll call this L naught, okay? And then I have a new um, change, right? I have an additional length, okay? I'm gonna call this additional length L. This is the stretch length. Now the total length would be L plus L naught, but let, look, look at that stretch length, okay? That's the extension length, whatever you wanna call it, that's L. Look how much weight it took. It took two of these weights, so M and M. If I wanna double L, okay? So let's draw this line across over here. If I want this to be 2L, and by the way, this is still L naught, okay? So all I've done here is I've made the total length of the string now, you know, whatever, you know, it's gonna be just L naught plus 2L, but the important thing is my extension length, 2L, is twice as long as the extension length when I had a total of 2M, okay? Now the force would just be 2M times G, okay? Right, because it's just M times G. But over here, what do I have? M, 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 4M times G. It took twice the weight, twice the gravitational force in this case, to get twice the extension length. That's all Hooke's Law says. End the story. Done. Proportionality. Okay? Now, that's great. Okay? And different springs kind of have different, maybe total amounts of masses are required, but that proportionality always holds true. So for example, a 10 centimeter long spring extends 12 centimeters when a one kilogram load is suspended from it, what, what will be its length when a three kilogram load, extent, um, load were suspended from it? But you can figure it out, okay? So extended from 10 to 12, what will it be now? 16, because the extension was two, and then I tripled it, so now my extension is six, 10 plus six is 16. 16 centimeters will be the total length of the spring now. Okay, so that's it, that's Hooke's Law, just proportionality. Okay, tension and compression. All right, so when something is pulled, it is in tension. That's like the spring we were just looking at, all right? If you squish something, you squash it, that's compression, okay? That's like when you stand on like a, a faux mat, right? And it's like, you know, gets condensed underneath, underneath you. It's compressed, compression, okay? There's other types of deformation, and those are 
you know, that, you know, things that can happen um, by bending, like in this picture. All right, oh, but first, when a girder is as shown, it is under tension on the upper side, compression on the lower side, okay? So the overall effect is a bend, okay? Because, I mean, that, that's what we could kind of refer to this as, as a bend. But we can think of the bend, right? We can think of this, this cantilever bend in a number of ways. But the best way for this class is to just think about how the top is under tension and the bottom is under compression, okay? And it turns out you can kind of bring those ideas together, and engineers do, and they have whole classes on cantilevers. But, you know, it's, it's, it is kind of cool to think that the top must be under tension and the bottom must be under compression, okay? It's not, it's not uniform. That's what, you know, bending like this means, okay? And here's another case. Right here, we have a girder, just like a big board or like you know some some you know piece of metal or something, right? That's a big object sitting on it. And now we have we put something in the middle, and then we see that we actually have tension in the top rather than in the bottom. Or sorry, we have tension in the bottom rather than the top. Okay, because before tension was in the top, now tension is in the bottom. And look what's in the top: compression. So it's kind of cool just by having two fixed points and the mass in the middle, as opposed to one fixed point and the mass at one end, we have swapped the vertical positions of tension and compression, right? Which is, I think, really fun to think about, right? Because of course it makes sense when you see it, but, you know, would you have thought of that on your own? I don't know. You have to draw the picture, right? Okay, so this has some real life effects on choosing the right type of beam shape, okay? Or um, as we've been calling them, girders, okay? So often construction uses an I-beam a beam where the cross-sectional shape is the letter I, okay? When the beam is used as shown, the shape of the I-beam maximizes strength because the top under tension and the bottom under compression have the most material. See, because they're nice and thick, right? Lots of material at the top and the bottom. That's where all the compression and, ten and or tension is occurring, okay? Um, and then the middle is, you know, kind of empty. That, in that way, it minimi minimizes the weight because the middle of the beam that is not under stress has the least material, okay? So that's the advantage of the I-beam, is that it's got, it's not just a solid beam, because a solid beam would work fine too, but it'll have all this extra weight filling in that dead space there, right? So the advantage of the I-beam is that it does what beams need to do, which is handle compression and tension, all right? But then it minimizes weight by cutting out material where it's not needed, okay? All right. So suppose you drill a hole horizontally through a tree branch as shown. Where will the hole weaken the branch the least? Here are your three options. Bottom, middle, or top. Okay, think about it. The middle. Because the middle, there's not very much tension or compression occurring. It's basically kind of remaining, those, the two effects are canceling out. And it's remaining its original length. And so that, because if it, if it was, if you, if you drill the hole and there's compression, the wood would kind of collapse in to fill that gap. If you drill the hole and there's tension, that's really bad because that's going to create a tear, okay? But the, the middle is going to be your best case, all right? So now on to the idea of arches, okay? We kind of saw some bending and stuff. So arches are all about having the right bend, the right curve. So roofs of some older buildings needed many support columns, okay? So this was a style of construction, you know, kind of humanity discovered that worked, okay? But it didn't leave a lot of uh, empty space, right? But with the discovery of arches, supporting columns were no longer needed. Right, so here's an ancient arch. All right, now we have, you know, you, you can actually have a, a wide amount of space rather than just a whole, like, you know, kind of sea of columns. Arches take advantage of the capacity of stone to withstand compression. They use the ability of stone to increase the strength of the structure. Because the idea is that if you look at these, right, they're kind of wedged in. These ones on the top are experiencing a lot of compression. Mo you know, they, they all experience a little bit of compression, but the ones at the top experience a lot of compression. Those are the last ones to be placed. And, but stone is very resistant to compression. Stone, however, is not very resistant to tension, okay? Stone will tear apart if it's under tension. So there's a kind of a different, different strengths of that material, all right? So if the arch is supported only, if the arch, excuse me, is supporting only its weight, then the proper shape is called a catenary. And the, um, the Arch of St. Louis is an example of a catenary, which we can see with this kid in front that by just hanging like a string or a chain in this case, it'll naturally hang in the exact same shape because there's just two points, two fixed points, and it's just supporting its own weight. All right, so then the points hanging under the influence of gravity as, and then, or also you know, being built to support itself are the same. It's kind of a really neat math mathematical engineering reality. 
And there's not a lot of true catenaries out there because mostly arches are made to hold things up, not just look pretty. All right. The catenary is also the natural shape of a chain that hangs between two points. And an arch rotated around is a dome. So the Jefferson Monument, for example, or the, the Hagia Sophia, um, these are examples of domes that are just basically made like arches, but in an extra dimension. Okay, so that's arches. And again, stone is good at, good at handling compression, which is why arches work, especially stone arches. Okay, last topic, scaling. Scaling is the study of how the volume and shape of an object affect the relationship of its strength, weight, and surface area. Okay, so let's unpack that statement, see what we mean. So strength is related to the area of the cross section, which is two dimensional and is measured in square centimeters. So that would apply to muscles, if we're talking about biology. It would apply to um, a column, if we're talking about architecture or engineering, okay? So yeah, so that means that the strength is proportional to the width of the column or the, the, you know, the, the cross-sectional area of the column or the cross-sectional area of the leg of an animal or the, you know, the, the leg muscle of an animal, okay? So strength is proportional to cross-sectional area, right? So this like, you know, cross-sectional area would be this, okay? This is the area, right? And here, this is my column, it's supposed to be in 3D, okay? So weight, on the other hand, relates to volume, which is definitely not 3D, it's 2D, and is measured in cubic centimeters. So that means that if you make something bigger, you're not changing its weight and its strength at the same rate, are you? Right? If I double the volume of something, I don't double its strength. Does that make sense? Okay. So for increases in linear dimensions, the cross-sectional area and the strength grow as the square of the increase but the volume and weight grow as the cube of the increase, okay? So what, what do I mean by increases in linear dimensions? Well, that'd be like, okay, taking some object and doubling every dimension of it. So like, you know, let's say I take an elephant. Well, I can make an elephant twice as tall and just be a really gangly elephant, right? But if I really wanted to consider making a bigger version of elephant, I'd make it bigger in every dimension. It would be twice as tall, twice as long, and twice as wide, right? Or this cube is right? One by one by one. But if I want to make it bigger, but still be a cube, it has to be twice as tall, twice as wide, and twice as long. Just like the elephant, elephant, if it's still an elephant, is twice as tall, twice as wide, and twice as long, okay? Now, when animals grow, that's not necessarily the case. Consider, you know, human babies versus adult babies. They're not all the same scale, right? They're, you know, their head is proportionally bigger than their body, and so on. So it turns out that biology and evolution don't, you know, exactly follow that idea, and there's good reasons why. The scaling is the reason why, okay? There's different, different needs at different life stages, okay? But let's just you know, consider a what if question. If that's the case, right? If I make something that's twice as wide, twice as tall, and twice as long, then how much bigger is its volume, okay? So I doubled all its linear dimensions, and its volume has gone up by eight. Really? Yeah, right? Let's think, right? The length is doubled, the cross-sectional area is quadrupled, and the volume, or the mass, is multiplied by a factor of eight, right? So doubling the linear dimensions, quadrupled the strength, and multiplied the mass by a factor of eight. If I triple the dimensions, then I have increased the strength, because remember, strength is proportional to cross-sectional area. I've increased it by a factor of nine, and I've increased the mass by a factor of 27. Whoa, right? It's a big difference, okay? So an elephant that is three times as long, three times as tall, and three times as wide would weigh 27 times as much, okay? So another really cool thing besides the strength and weight or strength and mass is the ratio of surface area to volume. This one is so fascinating. I'll talk about it I'll briefly about a couple of cool applications I can think of it on either end of the spectrum of science. So, okay, so here's the idea. So the surface area to volume ratio is just this, just surface area divided by volume. And we could go the other way, but this is the way we typically think of it. So how much surface area is there per volume for a given object, okay? Well, surface area goes with the scale, or I should say scales up with the size to the second power, okay? And size here is kind of synonymous with linear dimension, the term we used in the previous slide, okay? And whereas the volume goes up with the cube of the size, okay? So then when we take the ratio, we end up with a one over size is our proportionality. So what does that mean, okay? 
Well, let's do a concrete example. Let's imagine our cube here, okay? So I have a cube, and then I think about unfolding this cube like it's made out of cardboard, okay? And when I do that, I could then easily look at its entire surface area in this kind of this cross form, right? And these dotted lines is where you'd fold it back together, right? Maybe we've all made cardboard cubes, right, at some point as a class activity as kids, right? So the surface area of the one cubic centimeter volume cube here is six cubic centimeters. That's the surface area, okay? All right, so then the ratio then would end up being six to one, okay? So there's six cubic centimeters to, to one, or excuse me, six square centimeters, excuse, excuse me for saying cubic, I'm gonna confuse that, six squared centimeters to one cubic centimeter, a six to one ratio. And that's just going to be surface area to volume. So that means that this small cube has a lot of surface area per its volume, okay? But what about when we make it bigger, all right? When we make it bigger, now we've, we've doubled each side, okay? So now our cube is two by two by two. So now its volume, instead of being one, is eight. That's a big difference, it's eight times bigger. We already established that on the previous slide. But what, what about the surface area? Well, the surface area is only 24. How do I know that? Well, I can just count it, because I've got two by two here, so this is a four, right? And then I got another four, another four, another four, and then down here, two more fours, all right? So a total of eight, okay? So then I've got eight here, eight between these two, that's 16, and another eight, that's 24. That's where the 24 comes from, okay? So there's a total of 24, okay? And you can also just think of it as two by two times six, because there's six sides to the cube. And this works with other shapes as well, but the cube is a good, good way to start this, okay? So that means our ratio then goes, instead of being six to one, our surface, and now we have a surface area, it's still bigger in terms of cubic centimeters, it's 24 to eight, okay? This, they obviously have different dimensions. One is square centimeters, the, the, the numerator, and the denominator is cubic centimeters. But the ratio is the thing we care about. Now it's three to one. So there's still a fair amount of surface area for this bigger cube, but not nearly as much compared to the volume. There used to be six times as much surface area per volume when the cube was really small. Now there's only three times as much surface area per volume, okay? And what about when we make it bigger still? The ratio goes down. I won't go through all the steps. You, know, you can do that on your own. But now it's two to one. So the bigger it gets, the less surface area there is per volume, all right? So that means that really big objects have a lot of internal space, but not proportionally not as much surface. What does that mean? Well, it has a lot of effects, okay? So first, really real life practical one, cooling things, right? So you take like a little small pie, like a mini pie or like a muffin or something, it cools re relatively quickly out of the oven because it's got a fair amount of surface area per volume. You take a big old birthday cake that you just baked, that takes a long time to cool because it has a lot more volume per surface area than, than the cupcake or the muffin, okay? So cooling is very different if you're baking between those, those different volumes and surface areas of those different size objects, the cake being much larger than the cupcake, okay? And then what about animals? Well, it turns out that really large trees, like, you know, like basically any tree, but certainly I think the largest tree on earth, like a redwood tree, has to have a really complicated vascular system. It has to have evolved a really complicated way of pumping water throughout its, its huge internal volume, right? Let alone its, its height as well, right? But even if you think about a big tree that isn't particularly tall, it still has a lot of internal volume and it has to get water everywhere because it's got to get it all to its, all, all its leaves and all that, okay? But then think about a moss. A moss has no, um, basically, vascular system at all. It just absorbs water passively, kind of molecularly through its surface, right? It's a much more primordial organism. And how can a moss get away with this much simpler solution of, get, you know, of absorbing water and staying alive? Because it has a lot more surface area to bulk volume. It doesn't have to have a complicated system to move things around. I mean, it also applies to amoebas versus humans, right? We have to have a blood system and a heart to pump blood and keep us oxygenated and, and you know, have, you know, move unnecessary fluids around, all these complicated processes. Think about an amoeba, it just kind of absorbs chemicals through, you know, through its membrane and that's it. That's all it needs to do, okay? Because having a lot more internal volume means a necessary, much more complicated system. Last example, planets. So, so smaller terrestrial worlds like Mercury have a much more surface area per volume than big terrestrial worlds like Earth and Venus, which means that Mercury, its core completely cooled about you know, billions of years ago, and it doesn't have any more volcanoes or tectonic activity or anything because it's completely cooled. Whereas Earth and Venus both have volcanoes because we still have hot molten cores because those planets, like ours, have more 
volume per surface area than mercury, okay? Or less surface area per volume, right? So you could say it either way. All right, so cool. I hope those, those, those examples are interesting, all right? Quick check to wrap things up. If a one cubic centimeter cube is scaled up to a cube that is 10, cubic se or 10 centimeters long on each side, how does the surface area to volume ratio change? Make sure you can answer this one, all right? Don't, don't cheat and listen to my answer. Make sure you can do this one, all right? It becomes one over 10, okay? So the ratio has changed by a factor of one over 10. Pretty cool, all right? Well, that is it for this lecture. I hope it's been interesting. Thank you so much for watching this lecture on scaling.